In Hollywood, a dead man isn't who he appears to be, and someone just walked away with a million dollar insurance benefit. Now, forensics must prove that murder was part of the package. A police officer kills his wife in a freak car accident. But investigators believe he may have been driven to homicide. A simple farmer stands accused of murdering his brother, and a town rallies to his defense. So does forensic science. They look death in the face every day of their lives. From fragments of bone, drops of blood, and slivers of tissue, they can piece together the shattered circumstances that bring the deceased to their labs. Everybody has a story to tell, and each is a page in the coroner's casebook. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. Like and subscribe. When someone dies, their work begins. Coroners, medical examiners, and criminalists know that every kind of death leaves its subtle mark. And they know murder when they see it. Early in the morning of April 16, 1988, the Glendale, California 911 dispatcher received a call about a man in cardiac arrest. The call was placed by Dr. Richard Boggs, a respected neurologist. When paramedics arrived at his office, he explained that the man was one of his patients named Gene Hansen, who had a history of heart trouble. The victim had credit cards in Hansen's name. Before he called 911, Dr. Boggs said he'd done all he could to revive his patient, but nothing worked. Dean Hansen was declared dead at the scene. At the L.A. County Coroner's Office, the body was given a routine autopsy. The office sees 200 bodies each day, and this one was just another face in the crowd. Seeing no immediate cause of death except for a few marks on the heart, the coroner deferred to the diagnosis of the victim's personal physician, Dr. Boggs. Hansen's cause of death was listed as heart failure due to a dangerous heart condition. The body was released to the hands of John Hawkins, Hansen's companion and his partner in their successful sportswear business. He flew to California from Ohio to claim the remains. He had them cremated in respect for Hansen's last request. Hawkins, as his partner's sole beneficiary, then received the first million of Hansen's $1.5 million life insurance policy. Usually, that would be the end of the story. But this story was just getting started. Five months after the death, an insurance agent was closing Hansen's file when she noticed something strange. The face on Hansen's autopsy photo didn't resemble the photo supplied by the Department of Motor Vehicles. To double check, she requested that the thumbprint on file at the DMV be compared with the one from the autopsy. No doubt about it. These were two different men. And that raised two vital questions. Where was the real Hansen, and who was the dead man? The agent had uncovered something a lot more serious than insurance fraud. 
Though they're situated next to each other, the difference between Glendale, California and North Hollywood is like night and day. But this is where Glendale police went to solve the mystery of the dead man who wasn't Gene Hansen. Police determined from fingerprints and missing persons reports that the man was really a bookkeeper named Ellis Green. He was last seen leaving a bar in North Hollywood on April 15th. The next day, he was declared dead under an assumed name in Dr. Boggs's office. Sergeant John Perkins of the Glendale Police tried to sort out what happened. A photograph of Ellis Green's body that was depicted in the, in the doctor's office was taken to his elderly aunt, and that photo was shown to her. She identified that as being Ellis Green, her nephew. Now we knew we had the real body, the real name, but we still didn't have a, an exact or approximate cause of death. Demonstrating how Green died was only half the task before him. Investigators also had to prove that the real Gene Hansen was still alive. By now, months had passed. If Hansen were alive, he had an enormous head start to find a hiding place. John Hawkins, his partner in this elaborate insurance scam, had also vanished, along with one million dollars of insurance money. Michael Barton. Police concentrated on the last hey, person to see the victim alive, Dr. Boggs. Dr. Boggs. Hello, officers from Dr. Boggs. What can I do for you? Detective. Police paid a visit to him to find out about the man who died in his office. Boggs told them that he'd been a patient for years. Boggs knew him only as Melvin Eugene Hansen, or Gene. He had no reason to suspect it was an assumed name. Faced with a search warrant, he handed over his patient's files. Sergeant Perkins examined them. It was possible that Dr. Boggs was telling the truth. Gene Hansen's record showed that he'd been repeatedly warned about his condition, but refused to follow doctor's orders. But it was also possible that Dr. Boggs was in on this elaborate insurance scam, and the records themselves were doctored. Perkins pulled three EKG strips dated several months apart. He wondered if they truly demonstrated the life-threatening heart condition that supposedly killed Green. He asked a cardiologist to analyze the EKGs. The heart specialist told him that they indicated a mild, common condition that wasn't fatal. Perkins was more suspicious than ever that Dr. Boggs had intentionally faked the records. But he couldn't prove it. Then he found the answer was right on the EKG strips simple enough for even a layman to understand. Late one night, I was uh, sitting at my desk and I'm looking at these, at these EKG strips and I'm going through them and I'm looking at them and suddenly it, it became very obvious. One was, uh, was completely clean. One had a, a red dye halfway down the length of, of the EKG strip and the other one had a complete dye from the entire length of the EKG strip. And you suddenly think, wait a minute, these are all connected. So I put them up on the desk and put them end to end, and sure enough, the fractures matched perfectly. The red markings signaling the end of the roll formed one continuous darkening line across two of the three strips, allowing Perkins to put them into sequential order. But when he did so, the dates that Boggs wrote on the back of the strips were out of order and months apart. Uh, these were fabricated EKG strips. While Perkins was making his discovery, the case was progressing on a different front. Police were following the trail of Ellis Green's credit card purchases. The dead man's cards were still active and still in use. 
Investigators weren't sure who was using them, but they hoped it was the real Gene Hansen. They tracked the card to a bungalow on Key West, Florida. The rental agent confirmed that the tenant was a man named Ellis Green. He had moved out weeks earlier, and the apartment hadn't been rented since. Detectives looked for any clues that could reveal the identity of the former occupant. On a glass in a cabinet, they found one, a fingerprint. It matched Gene Hansen's. Now they had proof that he was alive. Then, in January 1989, nine months after his reported death, Gene Hansen, traveling under another assumed name, was stopped at the Dallas-Fort Worth airport returning from Mexico. He'd been acting eccentrically enough for customs agents to pull him over and inspect his suitcases. They found $14,000 uh, no. in cash that he failed to declare, thereby breaking the law. They also found the IDs for 13 people. Among them was Ellis Greens, the dead man in Dr. Boggs's office. Here was proof that he'd switched identities with the victim and pocketed some of his own death benefits. He was arrested. With Gene Hansen captured and the incriminating EKG strips, police had enough to arrest Boggs as well. They knew they had him for conspiracy to commit insurance fraud. In fact, they uncovered evidence that he and Hansen had pulled off some fraudulent claims in the past. The two of them, along with John Hawkins, staged car accidents for the insurance money. Dr. Boggs was the physician who signed off on their medical claims. But was there enough evidence to prove that Boggs actually murdered Ellis Green as part of the conspiracy? Without a body, they didn't seem to have much of a case. Boggs claimed that they originally hoped to steal a body from the morgue, but that proved impossible. Then, by gruesome coincidence, the conspirators said they happened upon Ellis Green's body shortly after he died. Despite how unlikely the story sounded, Boggs challenged the prosecution to prove he was lying. Glendale Police Sergeant John Perkins had to somehow turn an elaborate insurance scam into a case of homicide. Gene Hansen, the man who faked his own death, and Richard Boggs, the accommodating physician, were already in custody. Perkins was eager to put all the pieces together and wrap it up. But there was still no sign of John Hawkins, the beneficiary who fled with the million dollar insurance payout. And still, investigators were short on evidence to prove what they strongly suspected, that Dr. Boggs murdered Ellis Green to pass him off as Gene Hansen. We really needed somebody who could look at the uh, entire pieces of evidence that we had, that being uh, the autopsy report, some of the tissues. Uh, there was a stomach content that was collected at, at, at the time of autopsy. And, and examine those from an independent view to look at the crime scene photos to give us some indication as to this person did not die of natural causes. And that's when we brought in Dr. Michael Bodden. Michael Bodden is the executive director of the New York State Police Forensic Science Unit. He's also an expert on the nuances that death leaves on the body. He has worked on the congressional committees that investigated the deaths of John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King, Jr. In the case of Ellis Green, Bodden had slides of his heart, lung, and liver tissue, as well as photographs of the victim that were taken shortly after death. From this evidence, Baden could determine two facts with confidence. One, Green did not have a fatal heart condition, 
and two, his skin, which showed no other marks, was blue at the time of death, suggesting lack of oxygen. From these two facts, Baden reached a single conclusion. Green was suffocated. Except for the telltale blue color, in the absence of a struggle, suffocation leaves no marks. Its diagnosis comes from eliminating all other possible causes of death. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. A bullet wound, we don't need a diagnosis of exclusion because we find a hole in the body. Um, a stab wound or a uh, blow from a baseball bat all leave marks on the body that we can see at autopsy. But if something is put over the nose and mouth, causing a person to die because he or she can't breathe, and then that object is removed, the hand or a pillow, at the autopsy there's no specific finding that's going to say that he was suffocated. The evidence was enough to convince a jury that the three men had planned the crime together and that Dr. Boggs, the healer, was Dr. Boggs, a killer. These three individuals were not strangers to crime. Uh, they had hooked up um, probably uh, four years before this particular murder, and they had uh, worked out different ways of committing insurance fraud. And the plan that they evolved was somebody had to die. That person, they agreed, was to be Gene Hansen. And the only way that they could pull this thing off was with a doctor, and that doctor was Dr. Boggs. Police believe that Boggs picked Ellis Green up at a bar, the last place he had been seen. He bought him some drinks to make him more compliant. The victim's blood alcohol content was well above the legal limit. Then Boggs lured him to his office. Just in case the victim was still sober enough to fight back, Boggs may have incapacitated him with a stun gun. Then the victim was smothered without putting up a fight. Perkins believes that the forensic pathologist's determination of murder made this case winnable. Dr. Bodden's testimony in this particular case, I feel, was, uh, was that uh, uh, last inning, uh, you're down by two, uh, uh, and bases are loaded, and Dr. Bodden came in and basically hit a home run for us. In 1990, Richard Boggs was found guilty of first-degree murder and fraud. He was sentenced to life without possibility of parole. It took three years and a worldwide manhunt before police caught up with John Hawkins on the island of Sardinia. In 1995, both he and Melvin Eugene Hansen were convicted of fraud, grand theft, and conspiracy to commit murder. Hansen was given life without parole. Hawkins received 25 years to life. The work of the medical examiner undermined the murderous conspiracy of Gene Hansen and his cohorts. But whether a crime is ingenious or devilishly simple, the forensics required to solve it is equally complex. Rainy night of November 27, 1992, just after 9.30 p.m., a passing motorist reported what looked like an accident on Hawaii's Volcano Highway. Police arrived to find a van facing the wrong way, apparently after spinning. The responding officer recognized the owner of the van to be Ken Matheson, a sergeant on the police force. Ken was badly shaken up. His wife, Yvonne, fared much worse. Ken had tended to her in the back of the van until help arrived. She had lost a lot of blood. By strange coincidence, Yvonne Matheson was a nurse who helped deliver the responding officer's first child weeks before. 
paramedics moved her into the ambulance to rush her to the hospital at Hilo. The hospital where she worked became the place where she died. When Ken Matheson's fellow officers heard about the incident on the police radio, they went to see him at the hospital. Matheson told one of his colleagues that his wife's death was a terrible accident. She was driving the van when they started to fight. Things escalated. Enraged beyond reason, Ivan jumped out of the open window of the moving van. Ken said he slid over to steer the vehicle, then backed up to look for his wife. That's when he ran over her. Yvonne and Ken Matheson had once been divorced, but then decided to give their marriage a second chance. It seemed to be working this time, give or take the usual rough spots. Then, this tragedy destroyed it all. According to Hilo police, any accident that results in death is considered negligent homicide. For this misdemeanor, Matheson could expect a maximum fine of $1,000 and a year in jail. At the least, he'd be fined $100 or be sentenced to 100 hours of community service. Don't worry. In any case, he'd be able to keep his badge. He didn't protest the charges. As in any sudden death, a complete investigation would have to be conducted. It was a formality. The death of Ivan Matheson was unfortunate and tragic, but police had no reason to doubt Ken's story. While the investigation was underway, Matheson stayed on active duty with the police force. But after inspecting the scene of the accident, Hawaii County Police noticed some minor inconsistencies between the roadside evidence and Matheson's story. At first, they seemed hardly worth mentioning. Each year, tourists flock to Hawaii to escape the cares of their daily lives. The sun, the surf, and the primal fiery beauty of the volcanoes exert their cleansing influence. For Hawaii's inhabitants, life in paradise goes on just like anywhere else. Crimes are committed, accidents happen, and investigators are charged with determining which is which. In Hilo, traffic investigators inspected the area where the wife of Sergeant Ken Matheson lost her life. They found relatively little blood on the highway compared to what was found in the van. Though it was a little peculiar, they wrote it off to the rain and the fact that Ken Matheson had rushed his dying wife into the van after he struck her. At the police impoundment lot, the van had its own story to tell. It was routine procedure for a vehicle involved in a fatal accident to undergo a mechanical inspection. It negates any future defense claims of faulty equipment. Police also had to be sure the van was safe to drive before they could release it to Matheson. Because of the nature of this accident, the undercarriage was thoroughly inspected. Hawaii County Police Traffic Investigator Martin Elazar was surprised by the relative lack of damage he found there. However, when he was done inspecting the outside, the interior of the van caught his interest. I peered inside from the outside and I could see blood stains. Blood stains on the driver's side window, blood stains 
on the plastic cover to the panel area fronting the steering wheel. Blood stains up above there was a heavy concentration of blood and hair on that bolt. There was no reason for blood to be in the driver's portion of the vehicle. Elazar needed a closer look, but to search inside the van required a warrant. He asked Deputy Attorney General Kurt Spohn to request one. The warrant came through in the nick of time. Three months had passed since the incident. According to Spohn, their main piece of evidence almost slipped through their fingers. You do a mechanical inspection, and once all the mechanical inspections and the search warrants are finished, you return the van to the owner. And in this case, uh, the van was authorized to be returned to the owner. Fortunately, Matheson hadn't picked it up yet. The van was secure. The release authorization was canceled. A search warrant for the van's interior was issued. Now, Spohn had to face the dismal possibility that Sergeant Matheson's story might be a lie. And though they still had the van, another piece of vital evidence was lost forever. We decided that this case was um, possibly more than a negligent homicide. And because of that, we decided we should probably have a forensic pathologist do an autopsy in this case. Um, however, at that time, we found out that the body had been cremated. Yvonne Matheson's body had been autopsied three days after her death. On the island of Hawaii, the coroner is also the chief of police. A pathologist from a nearby hospital is retained as a consultant. The pathologist was told that the death was accidental. But a pathologist specializes in natural causes of death, such as disease. Even so, he could tell that the victim's injuries didn't jive with Ken Matheson's account. The pathologist noted injuries to the victim's head, arms, and hands that weren't consistent with being run over or tumbling out of the vehicle. But the interpretation of these injuries lay outside the scope of the consulting pathologist's training. It was really a job for a forensic pathologist who specializes in death by unnatural causes. Still, puzzled by his findings, the pathologist was sure to photograph every aspect of the victim and to take tissue samples. Now that the victim had been cremated, they were all that was left. A tragic accident case was now turning ugly. Spohn knew there was enough cause to open a homicide investigation, but without a body, there might not be enough evidence to resolve it. The original pathologist's photos and the evidence from the van would have to be enough. He braced himself for the inevitable public outcry. In some ways, it's kind of a no-win situation. Um, if you investigate and find out that the police officer is innocent and you announce that, everybody says, well, it's swept under the rug because this is a police officer. And if you investigate the case and you find out that the officer is guilty and you charge him, everybody says you're only charging him because you're buckling under the public pressure and he's actually innocent. Sure enough, six months into the investigation, widespread criticism forced Sergeant Ken Matheson's superiors to put him on desk duty while he remained a suspect. The press coverage brought to light an intriguing incident. A witness who read about the case in the papers told investigators that on the night of the accident, he stopped to help shortly after 9 p.m. As he pulled over, a man, possibly Ken Matheson, stepped from the back of the van and shined a flashlight in his eyes. He told the Samaritan that no one was injured and that the police had already been called. Then he sent him away. Thank you. 
investigators now suspected that perhaps the passerby interrupted the crime in progress. They just had to prove it. In Hawaii, Deputy Attorney General Kurt Spohn faced the unhappy task of investigating Sergeant Ken Matheson for murder. To find out more about the blood spatter in the driver's area of Matheson's van, he asked a colleague to locate the best blood spatter expert in the country. A couple of days later, he told me that it was someone by the name of Dr. Henry Lee, who was the uh, head of the Connecticut State Forensics Laboratory. Henry Lee, who is now commissioner of the state's Department of Public Safety, uses the laws of physics to uphold the laws of justice. His expertise is reading clues written in blood. That's called medium velocity. He's not afraid to get his hands dirty in the process. Like any substance, blood is affected by gravity and momentum. Every kind of bloodshed leaves behind characteristic clues. Stabbing will create a dripping pattern. The relatively low velocity of the weapon doesn't propel blood too far from the source. A speeding bullet, on the other hand, creates a bloody mist. And a bludgeoning wound produces large spatters that can spray far. By examining the tiny tails behind each drop of blood, Lee can determine the position of the victim and the amount of force used to create the injury. From this, and from the size of the wound, he can determine the type of weapon used and deduce the circumstances of a person's death. Lee is perhaps most famous for his work on the O.J. Simpson trial. He's also helped identify victims in mass graves in Bosnia. As soon as Lee received the photos taken from the Matheson case, he poured over them and became suspicious. He felt he was definitely looking at a crime scene. After I received the photograph, did the detailed examination, my initial reaction, something is wrong with this case. Some foul play took in place inside the van. From the photographs of the driver's side window, Lee could tell that the blood at the front of the van was spattered at medium velocity suggesting blunt force trauma. It appeared the victim was struck multiple times. The blood stains on the window also contradicted Matheson's assertion that his wife dived out of it. At the time of incident, this window was up. Approximately 200 medium velocity blood spatter was noticed in this area alone. Lee needed to see the van firsthand to trace the trajectory of the spatter. Strings were connected to each droplet to determine their common point of origin. It turned out to be the driver's seat area, about the height where a person's head would be. Lee's findings showed the damage was inflicted before she left the vehicle. Photos from the autopsy showed that the victim's head had sustained enough damage to kill her. Once Dr. Lee determined that a struggle had occurred in the van, investigators knew that Ken Matheson was lying. His motive for killing his wife was probably money. If she died in an accident, he would be paid $595,000, and if she died in an automobile-related accident, he would be paid $675,000. Sir, step out of the car. Put your hands up. Keep your hands where you can see them. Face down on the ground. Come on, over here in the ground. Face down. Move it. Face down. Based on the evidence, Ken Matheson was arrested on his day off. Police pieced together the murder. While Yvonne was driving, Ken Matheson struck her with a blunt object. She 
probably stopped the vehicle before he gained control and brought it to a stop. He continued beating her to the brink of death. Marks on her hand suggested she had tried to defend herself. In the dark, Matheson probably didn't realize he was leaving the blood spatters that would be his undoing. Once he was sure that his wife wouldn't survive, he carried her out of the van and ran over her. He carried her back into the van and waited for someone to stop and call for help. We had, you know, a gut feeling and a lot of suspicions. We didn't have any hard evidence. So Dr. Lee's blood spatter analysis is what gave us our first piece of really hard evidence. In 1995, Ken Matheson was sentenced to life imprisonment for kidnapping and murder. He's not eligible for parole for 25 years. Sometimes a coroner's findings can only tell part of the story. When that happens, forensic criminalists like Dr. Lee give a voice to the victims who would otherwise be silenced forever. Victim died. She cannot testify. Physical evidence speak for her. Matheson's simple but gruesome crime was undone by some forensic details that he just didn't count on. But can the same forensic science that proves murder also be used to prove that no murder was committed? Experts in New York State hoped it could. The town of Munsville in central New York is one of those quiet, picturesque places that blends unnoticed into the landscape as motorists rush past. In June 1990, it became an unlikely battleground for a most unlikely soldier. The trouble started in a shabby farmhouse outside of town. Delbert Ward, 59, awoke at dawn to milk his cows. He tried earlier to awaken his brother, William, but he didn't move. William hadn't been feeling well lately. Delbert thought it best to let him sleep. Delbert would take care of the chores without him today. The four Ward brothers were quiet and simple-minded. They'd spent their entire lives on the dairy farm. It was their universe, all they had and all they knew. Reclusive and childlike, the brothers even shared their bed, probably as they had done since boyhood. William, the oldest, was also the smartest and strongest. He ran the show. Delbert was his right-hand man. The other brothers, Roscoe and Lyman, occasionally pitched in to help out. But on this day, June 6th, Delbert was on his own. Even after he finished his chores, he couldn't wake Brother William. Something was wrong. Delbert called his brothers. The men didn't know what to do. Because the Ward brothers had no phone, Delbert and Roscoe walked to a neighbor's house to call for help. Their fourth brother, Lyman, watched after William until it arrived. 20 minutes after Delbert placed the call, state troopers and the Madison County coroner appeared at the farm. William's body was examined. No signs of foul play were noted. It seemed that 64-year-old William died peacefully in his sleep. His body was transported to the medical examiner's office while police interviewed the surviving brothers.
In the following days, the brothers tried to get on with their work. It would be difficult without Brother Bill. I'll give you too much at once. Just fill it on yourself. Delbert's life would be much harder, and his troubles were just beginning. At Williams' autopsy, the assistant medical examiner took tissue samples and careful notes. No indicators of natural disease were noted in the report. However, something unusual demanded attention. Pinpoint size hemorrhages in Williams' eyes, mouth, and windpipe. These tiny spots, called petechial hemorrhages, can have a number of causes. Often, it's the first tip-off to death by suffocation. The assistant medical examiner couldn't rule out death by unnatural means. On the death certificate, cause of death was listed as pending further study. The district attorney was contacted and told the case was bothersome. And here's where communication apparently began to break down. The message was passed along to the state police, and the suspicions about the petechial hemorrhages became garbled along the way. Now the possibility of homicide became a certainty. Delbert was taken to the station for questioning. He was interviewed for four hours. Isn't it true that you had something to do with him being sick? His interrogation was not recorded. I am answering his questions. Yeah, you got yeah, to check out that. According to attorney Ralph Cognetti in Albany, New York, Delbert was confused by all the attention. He only wanted to return to the farm, so he was soon willing to say anything. He signed the confession. Tell them what they want to hear and they'll let you go home. And that's in fact what they said to him. They certainly didn't let him go home after he confessed. But if you have an opportunity to read the confession, it really sounds like a Harvard dissertation. And you, you, you know, certainly inside, that that did not come from, from Delbert's lips. Nevertheless, the confession, coupled with the autopsy results, were enough to arrest Delbert. Later, a grand jury handed up an indictment against him for second-degree murder. To the people of Munsville, population 400, it was absurd to think that Delbert would or could have killed his brother. They believed the state had it all wrong. When his bail was set at $10,000, the whole town chipped in and raised the money in a matter of hours. The kindness of the neighbors and the plight of Delbert Ward earned an article in the New York Times. The groundswell of support for Delbert began to grow. A friend of the Wards brought Ralph Cognetti into the case. Based on his conversation with Delbert, Cognetti was convinced of his client's innocence. A review of the evidence suggested that the homicide charge was based more on Delbert's confession than on the physical evidence from the medical examiner's office. As Cognetti was putting his defense together, he received a fateful call. The man identified himself as Cyril Wecht. The name meant nothing to Cognetti. Uh, here was a gentleman uh, who explained that he was a forensic pathologist uh, from Pittsburgh and that he had read the article, read the, the story about the boys, and was willing to review uh, whatever evidence we had right. without any cost okay, so to in us. In other words, what you're telling me is... Dr. Cyril Wecht's reputation spreads far beyond the walls of the coroner's office in Pittsburgh, where he works as the chief forensic pathologist for Allegheny County. 
He's helped investigators on the assassination of Robert Kennedy and has consulted in the death of Elvis Presley. Besides degrees in medicine, Wecht also holds a degree in law. He'd read about the Delbert Ward case in the New York Times, and it piqued his interest. He requested William Ward's case file. After I reviewed the case file, which included the autopsy report, my initial impression was that there was an inadequate basis for any forensic pathologist to conclude that this was an asphyxiation death from suffocation, smothering. There simply were not adequate findings for such a diagnosis. Using the assistant medical examiner's original notes, Wecht formulated a more mundane diagnosis. William Ward died of heart disease, the number one killer of men his age in America. The Ward brothers had, in fact, told authorities that William had been in poor health for years, but he refused to see a physician. His symptoms were consistent with cardiovascular disease, supporting Wecht's theory. But the prosecution believed that William's illness may have provided a motive for his murder. Did Delbert Ward kill his brother William? The state of New York said he did. According to their theory, Delbert suffocated his brother to release him from his failing health. They said that it may have been a mercy killing, but it was murder nonetheless. The prosecution pointed to Delbert's odd behavior on the day of William's death. When Delbert couldn't rouse his brother at the crack of dawn like he normally did, he went about his chores anyhow. To the prosecution, that lack of concern suggested guilt. To Ralph Cognetti, it said more about the realities of life on a farm. It was a point that the prosecutor jumped on. How could a person who was so concerned about his brother's well-being go and milk cows? Uh, what came out at trial, and what I'm sure the jurors knew, because we had one or two dairy farmers on the jury, was that if you don't milk a cow when it needs to be milked, then that cow's going to get very ill. Cognetti and Cyril Wecht stuck with the idea that William died of natural causes, but they had to prove it. The victim had already been buried. All Wecht had to work from were the autopsy records, those same records and tissue samples that the state claimed showed nothing unusual besides the petechial hemorrhages. That's not how Wecht read them. He was confident that he had everything he needed to prove Ward's innocence. According to the thin tissue samples gathered at William Ward's autopsy, along with the medical examiner's data, William's heart was enlarged and his coronary arteries suffered a blockage of 20%. His right lung was heavily scarred and weighed twice as much as his left. His liver and spleen also were enlarged. Without a drastic change in habits, death by heart disease seemed inevitable for William. But Wecht had to undermine the prosecution's assertion that he was murdered to be relieved of his suffering. Though Wecht had only photographs and tissue samples of William Ward to work from, he called upon his vast experience on other cases, where he had examined the bodies directly. He noted the petechiae, the telltale red hemorrhages found in the victim's eyes and mouth. To the state, these were clear signs of strangling. They eclipsed all other symptoms. While it's true that petechial hemorrhages can indicate smothering, they're not enough to prove it beyond a doubt. Unless a person is somehow incapacitated before he's smothered, the body will likely show signs of a struggle. William Ward's did not. No injuries around the mouth, in the mouth, in the tongue, the gums. No injuries on or around the neck. Uh, no evidence of increased fluidity of the blood. No evidence of increased blueness um, of the blood. 
and no aspiration of gastric contents that will occur as a person struggles, so we had none of it. For the defense, there was no evidence of murder. William simply died in his sleep of heart disease. The homicide charge was the result of an unfortunate series of miscommunications that had grown out of control. Or you can take the incident seen by one person and then pass on to a second and to a third. And then when you get down to the sixth or the tenth or the fifteenth, you'll find that that story bears very little relationship to the original uh, creation, to the original version. Coming into the case as an outsider, Weck was immune to the preconceptions that Delbert Ward was a murderer. By looking at the case with a fresh perspective, he won Delbert's freedom. On April 5, 1991, Delbert Ward was acquitted of all charges. It grew like a bomb almost. It started small, and then by the end of the trial, he became what he is today, really, a, a, a legend, certainly in that part of the state. Cyril Wecht believes that the situation that Delbert Ward found himself in was not unusual. He's seen many cases that were tainted by a medical examiner's wrong assumptions, an investigator's speedy conclusion, or a simple misunderstanding. Unfortunately, these errors tend to compound themselves. We work closely and constantly with homicide detectives, with police, with district attorneys. We hear their versions. Consciously, subconsciously, those versions begin to take hold. And the mind then begins to work. And you build up then your own impressions, ultimately your own opinions and conclusions that fit in best with those. No matter how mysterious or suspicious a death may appear, the truth can be resurrected in the lab. Every day, the forensic skills of the medical examiner, coroner, and crime scene expert prove that the most important witness to a death is the deceased. The clues gathered at a homicide challenge investigators' preconceptions. The evidence now compels them to search for the killer in the last place they'd think to look. An unidentified body is abandoned on a Texas freeway. Investigators have miles to go before they gather enough clues to nail her killer. A young woman disappears. Detectives must weave a missing persons case around a tattered shirt and a shard of plastic. Big crimes are often solved by the smallest clues. Every criminal takes something away from the crime scene and leaves something behind. Forensics is the science of building a case by reading each remnant of blame. Northeast of Atlanta sits the city of Sugar Hill, Georgia. It's a little city of about 5,000 people, but it found itself in the midst of a big city problem. On the morning of April 16, 1993, a garage owner found a car abandoned in his parking lot. When he looked inside, he discovered a terrible crime. The body of a woman was slumped in the driver's seat, dead. Officers of the Gwinnett County Police Department responded to the scene. From the position of her body and the direction of the blood spatter, it was clear the woman had been shot in the head. Her purse was not in the car. Police could find no identification nor did they have a suspect. 
But the evidence did point to a motive. Assistant Police Chief John Latty believed this was a carjacking gone wrong. The ignition was on, but the engine was off, gas in the tank. Uh, she had power windows, and her window was rolled down, but she was seat belted in the car. In a random crime like carjacking, the perpetrator leaves few clues. Police didn't even know where to begin. All that changed with the arrival of a man named Michael Thompson. Driving by the scene, he noticed the commotion. Then he saw the car. It looked like his mother's. To Latty, Thompson's arrival was too much of a coincidence. We were interested in him uh, due to the fact that he showed up at the scene about the time we did. Um, also, he uh, had a shady past. He had a criminal history, was a suspected drug user. And uh, so therefore, the uh, preliminary suspicion fell on him. Michael Thompson confirmed what the vehicle registration had indicated. The victim was his mother, Emma Jean Thompson, age 53. When police checked into Thompson's background, they learned that his mother had called police in early April to report a burglary. Gwinnett County police officer Michael Chappell responded to that call. He was told that seven of the $15,000 the victim kept taped to the back of her dresser had been stolen. What? Michael Thompson didn't know it, but Emma Jean had told Chapel she thought her son might have stolen the money. She was banking on Officer Chapel to catch the burglar and, if possible, find her money. She actually showed him, upon his request, the remainder of the money, which was probably estimate to be in the neighborhood of $7,000 and all the money was in new $100 bills. Officer Chappell assured the victim that the money would be easy to find because it was in consecutively numbered brand new bills. After the murder of Emma Jean Thompson, police discovered that the rest of the cash was missing from its unusual hiding place. They believed Thompson might have killed his mother for the money. They would just have to prove it. The autopsy revealed that the victim had been shot twice in the head at close range with a large caliber weapon. Someone in the area must have heard the shots. Police set up roadblocks to question drivers about what they remembered from the night before. They found an unusual number of potential witnesses. Emma Jean Thompson had been murdered on April 15th. Traffic driving past the murder scene on the way to the nearby post office had been heavy. Many of them remembered it because it was tax day, and they said, we observed uh, a vehicle sitting behind the victim's vehicle. Uh, all of them said it appeared to be a police vehicle. That not only was it a patrol car, but it was one of Gwinnett County police patrol cars and that uh, it was a, a specific type and design of a police car, so we were able to determine that it was one of ours. Witnesses pinpointed the police car at the murder scene between 9.30 and 10.30 p.m. Many said it looked as if the victim's car had been pulled over. This disturbing revelation steered suspicion away from the victim's son. As more witnesses came forward, police had to consider the awful possibility that the killer was one of their own. The investigation began within the department. Detectives were aware that Officer Michael Chappell had responded to the victim's burglary complaint two weeks earlier. When Chief Latty looked for Chappell's report on the case, he couldn't find it. Chappell was asked about it. His reason for not filing a report on the burglary seemed credible. Of course, he had explanations that he thought it was a BS case and that he didn't want to bother with writing a report. Uh, so I instructed him uh, to gather all the information from that time and to write a report. While Chapel prepared the belated report, detectives interviewed the victim's hey, friends. How you doing? I'm Detective Smith. They said Emma Jean Thompson had been touched by Officer Chapel's personal interest in her burglary case. 
During the course of having these conversations with her friends, she also told her friends that Officer Chapel was concerned about her and was keeping an eye on her and that she had observed him following her uh, on several occasions. She believed that he was uh, concerned about her and was looking out for her. To detectives, it was beginning to look as though this guardian angel may have had only his own interests at heart. But they had no evidence to support this theory. Chapel had an alibi for the time of the murder. He said he went to the firehouse to watch TV between 8 and 10.30 p.m. Interviews at the firehouse, however, did not allay suspicion. His friends agreed Chapel was present on the night of the 15th, but no one could agree about when he left. Chapel's alibi was shaky. He still might have had the opportunity to commit the crime. A background check revealed a possible motive. Before the murder, Chapel had been heavily in debt. After the murder, his creditors told police he paid off what he owed with crisp $100 bills. But this would never be enough to convict one of Gwinnett County's finest. Detectives needed more proof before they could make an arrest. They had to be absolutely certain. Investigators soon learned the victim may have met her death by appointment. We did an interview with uh, one of the victim's close friends who told us that she'd had a conversation with the victim and the victim had reported that she was to meet with Officer Chapel that night and that he'd instructed her to bring her money because he'd recovered some of her money and could compare serial numbers and hopefully recover some for her. I don't envy them that task. One week after the crime, Officer Chapel was called in for a second round of questioning. If I'd have ever, if I'd have ever had the slightest thought that I'd be sitting here tonight talking to you about a murder, I'd have stayed, I'd have stayed out there. Chief Latty talked with Chapel in the police station for hours, hoping he could give them some information that would point the blame elsewhere. He could not. There are no other suspects at this point. It was during the course of the interview, uh, probably about two hours into the interview, uh, that Investigator Burnett uh, came into the room and informed him that he was being charged with this crime. Chapel became an enemy of the law he had sworn to uphold. He reacted by uh, slumping, uh, sighing, and uh, began to talk about uh, the fact that he knew there was no bond for a murder charge, an armed robbery charge, and he'd probably be in jail for a long time before he could prove his innocence. That's most, that is overwhelming evidence. All I've got is what I know happened, and that's not going to do me any good. I, don't know what that is. I have no alibi. I have nothing. Nothing would make Laddie happier than if Chapel could prove he was innocent. But friendship must take a back seat to justice. The chief knew what he had to do. Chapel was relieved of duty and told to turn in his gun and his badge. It was important to treat this case like any other. Only the evidence could prove whether or not Chapel pulled the trigger. Did Officer Michael Chappell kill Emma Jean Thompson in cold blood? To find out, search warrants were executed for his locker and the trunk of his patrol car. Chappell's belongings were entered as evidence and examined closely. His raincoat was sent to the lab and tested for any kind of trace evidence. Tests for minuscule amounts of blood were positive. The stains were shaped like high-velocity blood spatter. When a bullet strikes a body, the impact creates a fine mist of fluids that often blows back toward the weapon and the shooter. While the blood was being analyzed, 
detectives received another lead from a sharp-eyed car wash manager. The officer Chapel had been uh, into the car wash on the day that we had discovered the victim's body uh, and that he'd had his car detailed, his patrol car. Uh, also that he had paid her with a new $100 bill uh, for the uh, work on the car. His patrol car was brought to the crime lab and examined for potential evidence the detailers might have missed. An adhesive strip was used to lift any hair or fibers left by the victim. One stain on the upholstery warranted closer inspection. Jennifer Archer of the Georgia Bureau of Investigation Serology and DNA Unit was given a head start on her work. When I received the call from Gwinnett County Police Department, they indicated to me that they had performed a field test called Luminol. This test um, showed them that there was a possibility that there was a blood stain on the armrest of the car seat of the patrol car. Archer tested a swatch from the armrest to see if the stain was truly blood. She dabbed the cloth with two moistened cotton swabs. Each swab was then treated with a different chemical. Both swabs changed color, confirming the presence of blood. Was the blood human? Scientists had a test for that, too. A drop of the unknown blood was added to a sample of human antiserum, an enzyme that reacts with proteins found only in human blood. Gravity pulls the blood through the antiserum. If the blood is human, a white line appears. The blood in the police car and on the raincoat was human. Only the results of a DNA comparison could definitely link the blood stains to the victim, Emma Jean Thompson. The blood was placed in a gel medium and subjected to an RFLP test. In this process, mild electrical current separates the longer and shorter fragments of DNA into a banding pattern unique to the donor. Upon inspection, the patterns in the victim's DNA resembled the sample taken from the cruiser's armrest. Computer analysis statistically confirmed the match. No more than one in 10 billion people would share these patterns. Detectives had forged an unbroken chain of evidence between Chapel's coat, his vehicle, and the blood of Emma Jean Thompson. The lab confirmed the grim reality. One of Gwinnett County's cops was a killer. With the forensic evidence in place, events leading up to the murder became clear. On April 15th, Chapel arranged to meet his victim to rob her of the money the burglar had left behind. When the victim opened her purse, Chapel opened fire. Most of the incriminating blood evidence on the coat and in the patrol car was barely visible to the naked eye. But forensic science brought the remnants of the crime into sharp relief in court. The one key piece of evidence was the DNA evidence. There's no question about that. Uh, it's such powerful evidence. And uh, the fact that there was probably some very uh, serious doubt on the, on the, in the minds of a lot of people uh, that Officer Chapel could have or would have committed this crime. And so uh, it took some kind of uh, profound or solid physical evidence to link him to the victim's blood. As always, the ultimate test of the forensic evidence took place in the jury box. 
After 18 hours of deliberation, the jury returned a guilty verdict against Michael Chappell. But he received more mercy than he had shown his victim. He was sentenced to two life terms plus five years in prison, the stiffest penalty allowed by Georgia law short of a death sentence. Chappell disguised his crime to look like a failed carjacking. Other killers try to hide their crimes by disposing of the body. The roads leading to Houston are kept as beautiful as the city itself. But on March 27, 1992, a litter crew on a freeway outside of town made an ugly discovery. Yeah. You got a TV? Yeah. Anybody need a TV? Yeah. Hey, let's see it. The cardboard box seemed ordinary at first. Oh, yeah. Get this stuff. Let's do it. But when they pulled back the flaps, they found themselves staring into a makeshift coffin. Within lay the dismembered remains of a human being. The Houston Police Department's Homicide Division dispatched a forensics unit to the scene. Technicians scoured the roadside for evidence. The victim had been dead several hours. Dismembering the body would have spilled up to 12 pints of blood. But not a drop of blood or any other clue was discovered in the vicinity. Sergeant Mike Peters believed most of the forensic evidence lay elsewhere. Well, the conclusion that we came to is that this wasn't the actual crime scene. This is just a place where the victim had been placed by the suspect after the crime occurred. Police had to rely on the box's contents for leads to the killer. Besides the body, it didn't contain much. Just an old blue blanket. In the crime lab, investigators tried to identify the victim. But all they had was the torso. And beneath it, the victim's right arm. Police had to depend on partial remains to tell the full story. They determined the victim was a woman in her early 20s. The autopsy revealed she was pregnant. Investigators tried to match her fingerprints, but they weren't on file. Sergeant Peters hoped to have better luck with the missing persons reports. Only the night before, police had received a call from a man named Oscar Reyes. He said his wife, Cecilia, hadn't come home from her job at a liquor store. Police found Reyes and his wife's co-worker making missing persons flyers to post in the neighborhood. Oscar Reyes was able to identify his wife's torso from a surgical scar on her neck. His wife had been found, but her killer was still at large. Monday morning. Oh, What's the make and model on it, do you know? Investigators had to consider the possibility that Oscar Reyes had murdered his wife. Detectives interviewed him and checked his home for signs of foul play. If Cecilia Reyes had been murdered here, they would have found a large quantity of blood. None was detected. With Oscar Reyes off the suspects list, the investigators had to find other leads. They went to the store where Cecilia worked. Her manager said that she was last seen the night before as she headed home. Her co-workers described her as a cheerful, open-hearted woman with no known enemies. But she did have an unwanted admirer. A man named Gerardo Marquez occasionally hung around the store. They said he enjoyed flirting with the women, especially Cecilia. He often brought her presents, though she asked him not to. He seemed strange, but harmless enough. 
supposedly happened. Right here, my dad. Police paid a visit to Gerardo Marquez, who lived a few miles from the liquor store. He was a 36-year-old part-time fence builder who had a girlfriend. He was distressed to learn of the death of Cecilia Reyes. He hardly seemed like the kind of monster capable of killing and dismembering someone. He didn't hesitate to allow police to search his apartment. When asked about the scratches on his face, Marquez told police he'd cut himself while climbing a fence. His explanations seemed entirely plausible. His manner was completely disarming. Then, traces of blood were found in his bathroom sink. Marquez said he cut himself. Detectives reasoned that if a body had been dismembered here, much more blood would have been spilled. The killer's identity and the original crime scene remained a mystery. At the Houston Police Department crime lab, technicians looked for clues they hoped would lead to other suspects. They traced the box to a manufacturer in the same neighborhood as Marquez, but there the trail grew cold. Attention focused on the blanket that had been the victim's shroud. Though free of blood, it might conceal other clues. Hair, fibers, and other easy-to-miss trace evidence are often more revealing than a conspicuous blood stain. Criminalist Raiden Hillman examined it. There were several areas that looked like stains, but they were in a, um, in a particular pattern um, that indicated that maybe a piece of furniture had been set down on top of the blanket and refinished or painted on top of it. She measured the pattern of the dark stains. The legs of the furniture that had rested on the blanket formed a rectangle 14 inches wide by 25 inches long. While taking the measurement, she also noted minute feathers lodged in the weave of the blanket. She sent them for analysis. In a case no with few leads, detectives made the most of what they had. They asked Marquez's girlfriend to come to the police station for more questioning. She mentioned that Marquez did own a blue blanket stained with paint. It was under the dresser. She hadn't seen it recently. The blanket seemed to link Marquez to the crime, but detectives had to be sure it was the same blanket the girlfriend had spoken of. The distance between the paint spots would provide the answer. So armed with these measurements, Sergeant Stevens, Shirley, and myself went out to Marquez's house and measured the post legs on the base of the bureau, and they exactly measured the markings on the blanket. The dark stains on the blanket matched the dimensions of Marquez's bureau. Next, Hillman had to be certain that the stains came from the bureau. Following the trail of trace evidence, she reasoned that if the bureau left its mark on the blanket, then the blanket must have left its traces on the bureau. There would be fibers from the blanket stuck on the bottom of the furniture and at least tie the blanket back to the place where the murder had occurred. Hillman's theory about the fibers was soon proved true. Investigators found tiny blue filaments stuck to the tips of the dresser legs. With the fibers and the bureau legs, investigators began to build a case against Gerardo Marquez. To make the link between the victim and Marquez's apartment ironclad, Hillman used an infrared spectrometer to compare the paint on the blanket with the paint on the bureau. All right, we're going to try to match up to some paint that was found in the The apartment. spectrometer shines infrared light on the sample, which absorbs and reflects it in certain ways, producing a spectrum. The apparatus then measures how the sample absorbs the light and displays the measurements as a series of peaks and valleys. Every substance has its own unique spectroscopic fingerprint. In looking at the total spectrum, we can see 
um, what type of pain it is, and also um, we would compare the known sample as this is to any unknown samples. The spectra from the paint on the bureau and from the paint on the blanket lined up. The paint matched. Hillman and Sergeant Peters compared the fibers on the dresser leg with the fabric of the blanket. Once again, the two samples had come from the same source, Marquez's apartment. He had some questions to answer about why this blanket that was obviously affiliated with the victim was now affiliated with his apartment also. Based on the information from the lab, Detectives now believe they had found their man. They returned to Marquez's home. He remained cooperative and made it clear that he was eager for police to solve the case. He admitted that the blanket was his, but after using it as a drop cloth, he said he tossed it into a dumpster. The real killer must have retrieved it to wrap the body. The explanation was convenient and irrefutable. But investigators still had work to do. They re-examined his bathroom right, using leucomalachite, a chemical that makes traces of blood glow. It illuminated blood on the shower curtain. These stains could not have been the result of a minor cut. But again, Marquez had an easy explanation. He disclosed that he slaughtered his own chickens in the bathtub. Oh, that's right, you do chickens. Yeah, you know about. The freezer contained the proof and the likely source of the feathers Hillman found on the blanket. While they were in the kitchen, Marquez offered investigators some refreshments. Gerardo Marquez was acting like a man who was either completely innocent or totally cold blooded. As police searched for the killer of Cecilia Reyes, they pinned their hopes on the blood evidence recovered from the apartment of Gerardo Marquez. Marquez had told police that the blood found on his shower curtain was chicken blood. The lab would determine if Marquez was telling the truth. Swabs of the blood were tested with human anti-serum. It reacted, proving the blood on the shower curtain was shed by a human, not a chicken. But investigators didn't find enough blood to do a complete battery of tests, and not enough to indicate that a murder took place here. However, there was enough blood and enough questions to warrant another visit to Marquez. Technicians arrived to pull up the floor tiles in his bathroom. The room had been thoroughly scrubbed, but the evidence remained just below the surface. Yeah. All right, this is Mark. It was obvious that there had been, at one point, quite a bit. There was enough that had soaked down underneath the floor tiles. Tests on the sample revealed it was type O. Both Marquez and his girlfriend had given blood samples, and neither had that type. But Cecilia Reyes did. She had been here. She had died here. Based on the forensic evidence, Gerardo Marquez was arrested and charged with the murder of Cecilia Reyes. When presented with the evidence amassed against him, he said that while his girlfriend was out, Reyes had voluntarily come to his apartment. They argued, and she fell, struck her head, and died. In a panic, he had disposed of the body, fearing no one would believe his story. Investigators told Marquez that in order to believe him, right, they needed to here. examine the rest Show of the body to Go. confirm the cause of death. Where is it, right here? Cooperative as ever, Marquez led police to a field on the outskirts of Houston. There, abandoned in two more corrugated boxes, was the balance of the victim's remains. 
An autopsy revealed a bruise on the victim's head, supporting Marquez's story. Then, medical examiners found a deep knife wound in her throat. The stab wound was above the area where the victim had been dismembered and appeared to have been made by a different type of blade. That suggested the wound had been inflicted prior to the victim's death and not during the gruesome dismemberment. Once again, the suspect was caught in a lie. Police pieced together what had probably happened on the victim's last night alive. Leaving work as usual, Cecilia Reyes was accosted by Marquez. Hi. He abducted her and brought her to his apartment. There, she rebuffed his sexual advances, inflicting the scratches detectives had seen on his face. During the struggle, he stabbed her to death. To expunge evidence that the victim had ever been at his home, Marquez dismembered her remains. Then he placed the body inside three cardboard boxes. In the dead of night, he abandoned the boxes miles from his apartment. Though the suspect's guilt was ultimately written in blood, an ordinary blanket propelled the investigation. Gerardo Marquez was convicted of capital murder and sentenced to life in prison. Often, the most grisly murders are solved with the most mundane clues. The trick is knowing where to look and how to use them. Most homicide cases start with a body. This one began with a chance observation, a torn shirt half hidden in the grass, and a dark stain in the road that might be blood. When Officer Kenny Corcoran noticed them soon after breakfast, one Sunday outside his house on Smiling Acres Road in Tangapahoa Parish, Louisiana, he knew just what to do. Call Detective Chester Pritchett. Hey, what I got, Chester, I got blood in the road here. You, got, you see the mark of the car. Yeah. As soon as he arrived, Pritchett wanted to see what Corcoran had found. There was a stain in the road, Corcoran explained, most likely blood from a deer or a dog hit by a passing car. The torn shirt was a little harder to explain. Both men agreed they should dig into this a little deeper. I will, you hear something, you know I. Pritchett was known as a careful police officer. Before leaving home that Sunday morning, he had checked to see whether any accidents or missing persons had been reported. None had. Only on Tuesday did he learn of a young woman's disappearance. On the wall of the courthouse, Pritchett found a poster of a missing girl. Rebecca Forbes, a 19-year-old high school student who vanished a mere 48 hours earlier. She was wearing a white shirt, which seemed to match the one he found on Sunday. I'm going to have to go talk to the family, get a better picture, get an idea of what she was wearing. For Pritchett, her disappearance and the discovery of the torn shirt were sufficient grounds to begin an investigation. Six thirty p.m. Saturday, April twenty-eighth, nineteen ninety, at her home in Dedham, Louisiana, Rebecca Forbes prepared for a night out at the Italian Festival in nearby Independence. Hey, bye, mom. It was the last time Virginia Forbes would see her daughter alive. At the festival, Rebecca met a young man. They talked and danced, and were still together when Rebecca's friends lost track of her. None of them remembered hearing his name, but with the help of police records, Pritchett hoped they still might identify him. 
From police files, one of Rebecca Forbes' friends picked out the man's face. His name was Kelly Drott. Just 20 years old, he was well known as a troublemaker. He had been arrested more than once for house break-ins. In time, Bridget would interview Drott to check his version of events at the hair. festival. Before that, he hoped to have a report on the shirt Kenny Corcoran had found. At Louisiana State Crime Laboratory, Pritchett had given the shirt to forensic scientists George Skiro and Pat Lane. He asked them to learn all they could from it. Skiro's examination began with the physical state of the shirt. He scrutinized it for what is called trace evidence, hair, fibers, material of any kind adhering to it. Next, the most basic question, were the dark stains really blood? To determine that, Skiro conducted a cascade of chemical tests, designed successively to confirm or eliminate the presence of blood. First, a cotton swab was moistened with distilled water. Blood dissolves in water, turning the tip of the swab brown. Then, a reagent called phenothaline was added. Now, if blood was present, the brown stain would turn green. Next, a drop of hydrogen peroxide. Blood products produce an intense pink color. Finally, Skiro carried out a test to confirm his diagnosis. Okay. Adding another chemical, he looked for red crystals of hemochromogen, a chemical complex formed only in the presence of blood. And this is the final step in proving that uh, substance is blood. It's not species specific, this particular test. It just tells us that blood is present. For Skiro, this was just the beginning. He would schedule further, more elaborate tests. Was it human blood he had found, or that of some animal? And if it was human, whose was it? Getting answers would grow more urgent as the investigation progressed. Meanwhile, Pritchett returned to Smiling Acres Road, which he had declared a crime scene. Inch by inch, his men scoured the ground, collecting anything, however insignificant, that could be a clue. We recovered cigarette butts. There's a possibility of saliva off the cigarette butts, maybe assistance. We've got a couple beer cans and a bottle that uh, could yield the same thing. And there was this, a tiny piece of clear plastic. I'm going to submit that, all these other items to the crime lab, just to see if they can do something with them. So we might get a good was the fragment of plastic just roadside more, litter, or was it a clue? Several more weeks would pass before subtle, its true significance but, uh, emerged. I think we got some good information. On Friday, May 4th, six days after Rebecca Forbes' Kelly, disappearance, Detective Chester Pritchett okay. finally caught up with suspect Kelly Drott. Did he simply have a brief encounter with Rebecca? Or did he know more than he was prepared to say? Drott admitted to meeting Rebecca. She bummed a cigarette from him. They danced. At around 10 o'clock, she disappeared into the crowd that was the last Drott saw of her, he said. Casual, charmer or not, Kelly Drott's story began crumbling as soon as investigators examined his car. In the trunk, there was no mat, no floor covering, and it had been pulled out, and there was water in the wheel well, which indicated to us he attempted to wash the car out. From, and on the hinges and under the tail light, we found uh, splatters of what appears to be blood, tiny specks, a lot of them. He says that it's deer blood, where he ran over a deer, put the deer in the trunk, and it was thrashing around. Uh, that doesn't, you know, doesn't make a lot of sense. Pritchett immediately ordered the suspect's car impounded. It, too, would be scrutinized by George Skiro and Pat Lane at the crime lab. I'll look in the outer way places where, for instance, if someone tried to clean up blood, where would this blood go? Would it seep down behind the seat cushions? Would it go into the threads of the fabric? I'll look in all those areas. I'll look in the out of the way areas. 
As the search continued, Skiro began noticing blood in places inconsistent with someone having hit a deer. Blood marred the inside of the door jams and the light switch. Now the pressure was on. Skiro had to determine the source of the blood, from the blood-stained shirt and in Kelly Drott's car. Okay, once we determined that there was human blood on the blouse and human blood in the trunk, the next step was to do an ABO blood type and try and determine what type blood it was. When we did the examination, we found out that both samples from the blouse and in the trunk of the car were type O blood. The test was less conclusive than Skiro had hoped. Type O blood is the most common human blood group. Here, as it turned out, both the possible victim and the possible suspect possessed it so it did not provide any information of value. The next step was to send it off for DNA analysis to see if a more specific genetic profile could be built up on the bloods. It would require several weeks for the DNA tests to be completed. Before that, the case would take a dramatic new turn. Sunday, May 19, three weeks after Rebecca Forbes was last seen. Two men hunting along the Tangapahoa River stumbled across a badly decomposed corpse. Well, with the way this case started was with a mystery. We had um, some bloody clothes found in the middle of the road. Next thing we know, we got a vehicle that has blood in it, allegedly deer blood, but we proved otherwise that it was human blood. And the final thing we needed to bring this case together was to find a body that would go, that we could link to all these different scenes critical to connecting the elements of the Rebecca Forbes case was GeneScreen, one of the most sophisticated testing laboratories in the United States. The state crime lab had identified both Rebecca's and Kelly Drott's blood type. GeneScreen was charged with refining those analyses. In our cells, we each possess our own unique individual form of DNA. Gene Screen's expertise is in testing bodily tissue to reveal its DNA fingerprint. Blood from Kelly Drott's truck and from the blood-stained woman's shirt had already been sent to the lab. The lab also received material from Rebecca Forbes's badly decomposed body. Oh, that's the Gene Screen director, Bob Giles. Uh, DNA is a very useful forensic tool. Uh, it's very useful because it's highly discriminatory at identifying individuals. Uh, in this particular case, it was very important because uh, this is a, a case involving circumstantial evidence. And without the DNA testing, the investigators were not able to link the victim's blood to the suspect's car. When the test results were in, they could not have been clearer, as gene screen scientist Judy Floyd explains. What the DNA did tell us, uh, in effect, was that the blood on the blouse was that of Rebecca Forbes. And we can say that with a high degree of certainty. Uh, the blood in the back of the car of Mr. Drott was also that, most likely, of Rebecca Forbes, the victim. What the DNA did not tell us was what actually took place that night, uh, the chain of events uh, that led to that tragic attack. One final piece of evidence cemented the case against Kelly Drop. That odd-shaped piece of plastic found near the bloody shirt on Remember Smiling Acres Road. On Smiling it was Acres a fragment Road of crystal a from a watch. Rebecca Forbes had been wearing a wristwatch when her body was found at the river. The broken crystal certainly looked as if it came from Rebecca's watch. It fit snugly onto its face. But Lane needed more evidence to prove that the two parts belonged together. Along the edge of the crystal, he noticed a series of pits, places where tiny pieces had been left behind when the crystal had been smashed. Lane made a cast of the underside of the rim to prove that the patterns on the rim and the crystal matched. Okay, the piece that we're looking at right now is going to be the microcell cast that was done of the watch face, more specifically the rim area uh, where the glass crystal would actually have been glued into or onto the face of the watch. Now Lane could make a detailed comparison between the nicks along the edge of the crystal and the tiny fragments of plastic still trapped under the watch rim. That, that piece of crystal fit in 
with the little imperfection breaks that had stuck in the track along the margin of that and, and really turned out to be a very beautiful fracture match of that crystal. With the final piece of evidence in place, the investigators were able to reconstruct what took place the night of the Italian festival. Rebecca had met Kelly and danced with him. Around midnight, he took her for a ride in his car. They stopped along Smiling Acres Road, where they argued. In a violent rage, Kelly Drott killed Rebecca Forbes. The victim is dead, obviously, in this case. She can't talk. The suspect, even though he is talking, we don't know if he's being truthful or not. The physical evidence will not lie. It has the capability of telling us at a moment in time that a certain event took place. It may not necessarily tell us a whole sequence of events, but it allows us to at least pinpoint at one particular moment in time this event took place. That can then be weighed against the statements that have been made by suspect. On May 23rd, just four days after the discovery of Rebecca's remains, Kelly Drott was arrested. Convicted of manslaughter, he was sentenced to 21 years in prison. Well, Kelly worked on a construction crew at a local chicken processing plant, and he had a disagreement with one of his fellow employees that rides to work with him. He told the, he told the guy several days ago that if he didn't watch his mouth, he'd find himself in the river just like that girl he had dumped in the river. Evidence that can be seen by the naked eye is vital to solving a murder. But forensic science, coupled with rigorous investigative techniques, brings the smallest clues to light and brings more killers to justice.